Hello and welcome to Flying High with Flutter. My name is Alan Wyma and I will be the host of this show. So this show is both a podcast and I guess you can call it a video cast. In this show, we'll be talking about Flutter and why we use it. And also we'll be speaking to other people who also use Flutter or maybe other people who don't use Flutter and we'd love to hear kind of back from them about what you know their opinions are. And I wanted to use this episode to give a quick introduction about, you know, who I am and where I came from and how we got over here. So, like I said, my name is Alan Wyma. Originally, I'm from USA, from the Chicago South Side, so you might hear a little bit of my accent. But now I'm living in Hong Kong, so you may notice that sometimes the show is maybe too early in the morning if you're uh, coming from U.S. And in any case, like I said, I'm a software engineer, uh, originally from U.S., living in Hong Kong. While I'm here in Hong Kong, I actually, uh, I had several different jobs. I've been working, I worked before in a bank, I worked before in a finance company, software vendor, I worked before in some digital agencies, I worked in just robotics, I've worked in just so many different things. And having that experience has really brought me a lot of experience and a lot of knowledge and firsthand knowledge at that about what I think is good and what I think is not good. But of course, I still have a lot to learn. But at the same time, with about 10 years under my belt, I have some uh, knowledge I'd like to share with people who are both beginners and maybe intermediate. And uh, I think they can also share some things with us. And again, this, this, this channel is specifically going to be about Flutter. The reason that we started to use Flutter, um, so again, I, like I said, we have our own consulting company. We basically specif- uh, specialize in building products for smaller companies, mostly startups. And we specifically use uh, three different types of technology. That is uh, Elixir for mostly our backend work, Flutter for our soon to be nearly all of our front end work, but definitely for you know our mobile apps. And then of course we use uh, Rust and Rust will just be for things that we need to be a little bit more speedier. But in general, I would say most of our work we do Elixir and Flutter. Now uh, Elixir is another story in itself, and to tell you the truth, I'm also a uh, panelist on a podcast called Elixir Mix. So maybe you've heard of me from there, or maybe not. You can go ahead and check that out if you have interest in Elixir. Also, we run another YouTube channel uh, called Plangora, which is the name of my consulting company that I have here in Hong Kong. And on that channel, we also show you some tips and tricks about using Elixir. And so if you have an interest in Elixir, you can go ahead and check out that channel. But going back to this channel, like I said, Coming from my history, uh, I've worked a lot with different technologies. I've worked with PHP, i worked with a little bit of Java, uh, a little bit of C, Ruby. We, like I said, we use Elixir right now. There's all kinds of stuff. And one of the things that was always difficult for me was creating our own mobile apps, right? Now, in my past, I've had to use Xcode for when I created my iOS apps. And I actually created an iOS app so long time ago, it was actually using Objective-C. So this is way before Swift. And I think it was just around a time when they started adding in some niceties like automatic arc, so automatic reference counting, things like that. So I think I had a little bit of reference counting things I had to deal with. So that's kind of my history of, of, of mobile apps and kind of how far I stretch back to is Objective-C days. And so for the Objective-C, uh, yeah, I kind of actually liked using it. But whenever I wanted to make the UI itself, which of course is the most important part of, of any app, and especially mobile app, is uh, the, the UI. And so when I wanted to make my first mobile app, we had to use this thing called Interface Builder. And it seems pretty easy, right? It's just basically drag and drop for people who've ever used it. If you haven't used it, really, it's just drag and drop pieces and try to create your UI. So with that, I actually made some pretty okay looking apps. But then again, they were very basic and the UI wasn't very special. But whenever you make an iOS app, especially nowadays, you also have to make a a counterpart in Android. My very, very first app I've ever made for mobile was actually first an iOS app. And again, like I said, I use Objective-C. And I remember when I had to learn how to do this, actually, I was told uh, by my boss, he just kind of came in one day and said, looks like we have to build an iOS app. And I said, great, uh, but who's going to work on that? And my boss at the time only had an Ubuntu machine. So, of course, he really couldn't do it. And I had a Mac and uh, he basically said, "Uh, well, of course you. And I said, excuse me, I don't even know how to make an iOS app. He said, well, I guess you have to figure it out. So that's kind of my history with working with mobile apps is I had to basically figure it out myself. So I had to take a course. I took this course with a guy who originally was one of the people who came up with Next Step, which is what Mac is based on, which in turn is what iOS is based on, I believe. And so I learned how to make mobile apps from actually taking this course. I think it was from Apple University, and it was taught by, like I said, this professor who used to work on Next Step a long time ago, way before we had Mac OS, or at least Mac OS X. And so from there, I really got a really good basic and basic knowledge and all this kind of stuff. 
And like I said, of course, as soon as you create the iOS app, within a few months, they ask us for the Android version. Again, I never had that experience, and so I guess I had to figure it all out myself. So I basically just took what I did for my iOS and poured it over nearly class for class. And because we had to use Java, there was no Kotlin back then. We had to use Java. I basically just had to, you know, make it work. And because, of, like I said, because we had to use Java, we had to actually create another one or two classes just because Java is just a little bit more verbose. All in all, I would say the logic and a lot of the names were the same. But again, I had to just redo everything from using the Objective-C syntax to the Java syntax. So one of the things that I really wanted to, to do and get into was actually, like I said, creating apps and finding a way that we can create an app much easier. One of the ways that first came out was PhoneGap. PhoneGap was kind of cool, but wasn't so easy to work with. It took a lot of power. It, it kind of worked and didn't work. To be honest, I really can't remember too much about it because it's been so long, and I don't think people really still use it anymore. But I believe it was just a, a web browser kind of on the phone, and uh, it wasn't very nice, so people tended to stay away from that one. At least, again, that was my experience. I think the first app that was really, the first framework that was really interesting and useful for people, and I, I think everybody will admit that, is that when React Native came onto the scene, right, it's like you use React, their technology from Facebook, and you just, you know, write your React components, and you just write JavaScript, and everything kind of works. Well, the ideas were pretty cool. I did pick up React. I, initially, when I tried to use React Native, I didn't really understand too much about React. But after some time, of course, I started to pick it up, but actually I didn't really get very far because every single time I tried to run and work with my app, it just kind of failed. It just wasn't working very good. And so in the end, uh, yeah, I just kind of dropped it and left it uh, be. I didn't really touch it very much. So like I said, I didn't really understand React so much. I had a hard time trying to wrap my head around, how do I do this? How do I do that? I had a hard time to actually figure out how to even start my app. So. For people who have ever worked with React Native, there's actually multiple ways to run your app, right? You have so many different kind of starter templates out there. Maybe they've agreed on something, but I know that I went and looked around and found this guy does it this way, this guy does it that way. I don't think at the time Facebook actually had a way that they said, this is what we're doing. And so, uh, yeah, like I said, I, I kind of parked it and said, okay, I'll come back to that after some time. I did pick up React eventually. So um, yeah, I, I eventually was gonna go back to it at some point. And uh, talking about another kind of thing, right? So other apps out there, there's Ionic, which I think maybe actually be running with PhoneGap, but in any case, Ionic, uh, yeah, that one, I mean, once you see it, you can tell right away, this is not very attractive. It's not very interesting. And you can tell it looks like a website running on, on there. And so it just, that really didn't make sense for people. It, it was difficult for me to say as a, somebody who's doing software for somebody to say, hey, why don't you pay me for this app? Because it, yeah, I mean, it looks, looks so nice, right? It, it really didn't. And uh, yeah, again, going back to the React Native, uh, the other thing too is dealing with JavaScript, right? So I did tell you, I did have a very big history of different languages. JavaScript is kind of one of those languages which is people have to pick it up, they have to use it, they have to learn it. But the issue with JavaScript is that, you know, when you're using a website, you click a button, nothing happens, right? And being a developer, I have to pop open my JavaScript console, take a look to see what, why, why, what's going on. And you can see all this red text and say, okay, it looks like I, I or the developer made a mistake. So that's not so, you know, that's not so fun. Um, the nice part about React is that they did use React to generate actual real uh, UIs, right? So if you take a look at, of course, Facebook uh, mobile app, that one's all done with React Native as far as I know. And they, uh, yeah, it just kind of works, right? And and everything looks quite nice. It's quite native. It's not using a web browser, but underneath it, it actually is just using a web browser underneath for all of the um, all the data and all that. Uh, but of course, rendering all the components, those are all native components. So that's actually a pretty cool thing. But I mean, there has to be a better way, right? Because I've been there where the Facebook app actually broke. I've been there where another React Native app just broke. It was just like using a web browser. You click or tap on a button and nothing happened. And so um, I heard about Flutter and I just said, you know what, Flutter is just another one of the things just similar to React Native, similar to PhoneGap, some of these other ones, right? And so I took the time, I, I bought a book from Prag Prog, uh, Pragmatic Programmers, and I went through it and I saw some videos and I said, wow, this is really great. This is fantastic. And actually playing with it some more. And we, had, we actually got about two projects in about the time. Uh, one for an existing client of ours and one for another uh, company that we worked with directly. And um, yeah, we basically were picking up Flutter as we're creating these apps. And of course, you know, with any kind of technology, the first time you use it, it won't be so great. But as you're using it, 
as you're really learning and as you're digging in more, you start to realize, okay, this is how things work. This is how it goes. Okay, not too bad. But I have to say that React is definitely in the first UI, I would say, the first UI kind of framework, and that includes HTML and CSS, where I could actually feel like I could build anything I want. Anything. I mean, I could just take a look at a, at a design and say, wow, look at this thing. That's just, you know, a container over here, uh, put it over here, you put another box over here, you put a stack on this that goes like this. And just now I can just take a look at something and I can just say, okay, I can create this and I'm not afraid to do it. Now, the other thing that kind of worries people and worried me, of course, too, is what if Apple or Google or both came out with something brand new that I wanted to use? And I couldn't because it's part of a newest SDK. I have to wait for somebody else to create the plugin. Well, there's two things uh, to say to this. One is that the plugin ecosystem for Flutter is really, really fantastic. It keeps expanding and it's really great. I, I just take a look for it for yourself and uh, you'll find out. But the other thing too is that creating your own plugin, writing native code is very straightforward. One of the products I also had to work on with this other company that I, I talked about a little bit earlier um, is that they asked us, they asked my company, they asked us, me in particular, to help them to make a Flutter plugin, which will allow us to directly talk to the uh, SDK. So we're working with this robot. I won't say the name of the robot. And it had a particular SDK because, of course, it's a robot. It has to be able to do certain functions. And I managed myself, well, of course, with some help from the other guy, but mostly myself to create the plugin from scratch and write the native code. I used Kotlin because it was an Android running kind of uh, robot and hook up to the SDK. And it was very straightforward. It was very easy. And I've also uh, taken plugins from other people and contributed back to them and sent it back. And it's been very simple and very easy for me. I'm quite amazed. Uh, I feel like Flutter is just a very thin layer above the native code that you write right now. And also, like I said before about performance uh, of like React Native apps or Ionic apps, Flutter does compile to native code. So it is super fast. It's crazy fast, right? It's about 60 frames per second running on the device. I mean, it's, it's really uh, amazing what you can do, right? And so, after playing with the stuff for at least four to six months, I would say, yeah, I was pretty much sold. Except for certain websites, I am very much considering to use Flutter for other projects and using other websites. Uh, the cross-platform part, like I started talking about with iOS and Android, that actually extends even bigger now that web is, is now production. And I can also say that we also delivered a mobile, or sorry, a Windows app. We actually developed the entire Windows app using Mac. So we just took Mac we just been running the native app uh, on our own Mac machines using the Mac and of course everything. And it just worked and we just exported it. We wrapped it up in, in a setup installer and we exported it, gave it to the client. Well, I have to admit the first time it didn't really work uh, on some machines, but that's because uh, of just some language issues. But once we solved that, but in any case, some people did have English machines. And so on those machines that we were testing everything on, we ran the app and it just worked immediately. It was just great, fantastic. And so I'm pretty much sold that for basically uh, UI facing things that need to be very beautiful and very amazing and work great. We're probably gonna be looking at Flutter as a first choice, even for some websites. So that's kind of my history and where I came from in my thought process when it came to looking at and using Flutter. Now, the other thing too that I have to talk about too is uh, Flutter is actually very simple on itself. I had to use React before in some projects. Uh, I have never used React Native in a real project yet, but I have used React in a project before, and it can be very dangerous if you don't know what you're doing. I'm not kidding you. I remember in one project that they pushed for React in. It took about 30 seconds, I believe, to render about 200 rows in the table. That is really slow for people who, who, who don't know. It's quite amazing how slow it is. but. Flutter, of course, you can also have some slowness, but in all honesty, it's been quite quick for most things that we're working with. Uh, you can probably have the same issue too with Flutter, but I have never had an issue where things were too slow in rendering part, but I have, of course, had it with React Native. Uh, and I'm also teaching uh, somebody right now, um, just one-to-one, -one, and that's also been going great. He's been able to pick up a lot of the concepts by himself. Uh, he did come in with some programming background. Uh, we've also been putting on some workshops over here. And I have to say, I'm quite surprised that 
designers themselves are actually able to pick up Flutter quite quickly. And they're able to get very far just by, you know, taking a look and thinking about, okay, this and that. And, and it's just been amazing for, for that I can see that people can pick up Flutter with very, basically very little coding background. And so because of these reasons, we have decided that we wanted to really bring more awareness to the Flutter community. I think Flutter is in a very unique and interesting position where they have backing of a big company like Google. And they actually also have backing from other big companies too. I think uh, Alibaba, I believe, is using it. Of course, Google is dog feeding it. They're actually using it themselves in some other apps. And some other uh, companies, I believe Square is also using it too, right? So it's not just Google themselves. And it's also not just small places like, you know, like, like us or like other clients that we have right now. Bigger companies are looking at this. I believe Toyota is actually going to be using this technology that's originally came from using mobile apps to using it in their entertainment systems. Ubuntu, I believe, just announced that they're going to be using, uh, they're going to be pushing also developers to use this in their apps. So this is really a quite exciting time for Flutter in itself. And um, because of this, it's in a really weird spot where it's like popular, but at the same time, it's also still kind of new and not so popular. I don't know if that actually makes sense. Uh, it, like, it's really in, the, in a, a tipping point. And so we want to be a part of that process to where we can tip that into now we're at a scale where people will start to consider this over React Native, over iOS, over Android directly, right? That's what we want to help to, to show people. I mean, there could be situations where using the, the kit or using the directly the native app by itself could be what you're looking for. But, you know, you should really consider this. And that's kind of what we want to bring awareness to. And so we're making this podcast for people who are both beginners and have actually played around with Flutter itself. It's for people who are maintaining packages and kind of want to stay up to date with what's going on. It's for people who just, for businesses even too. So if you're coming in from a, a, a business side and you want to actually create your app and you don't know what to do, maybe you heard some technical people talk to you and mention the word Flutter. And so maybe you want to hear what's this Flutter all about. And that's basically our core audience is, you know, people who want to level up in Flutter, people who want to see what's going on, business people who want to hear about who else may be using Flutter and kind of what it's good for, things like that. And so how we're going to do that is we're going to be interviewing people within the community, package maintainers, other developers, hopefully some people from Google, hopefully some people from the core team, even without, even outside of Google and businesses, like I said, who are actually using Flutter in production, right? And I'm also looking to bring apart, to bring over people who maybe actually aren't using Flutter and people who didn't want to use Flutter and even looked at Flutter because it's good to also hear the other side. I believe that using Flutter for something that a game engine should be used for, that is probably not the best use case. But I think for basically 90 to 95, maybe even 99% of apps out there, Flutter is a really great choice. Even if you're only going to be creating this app only for Android, only for iOS, only for the web, I think that hearing people to say, I didn't use Flutter because of this, right? It gives us another reason to say, okay, you know, why is that? Does this problem also affect us too? So for instance, one of my clients, they use Flutter for their iOS and Android apps, but they don't use it for web. And one of the reasons is because they doesn't have SEO yet. Well, that's coming in some port in set point. And also the other reason too, is I believe they said that because uh, they already have a lot of their website already built up using other technologies, so making the switch doesn't really make sense to them. Okay, fair point, right? But it's good to hear, you know, what's people talking about, what are they thinking about? In any case, this is what the show is all about. And the other thing, too, is this is not just a normal podcast or YouTube cast, right? We are using this recording software, which actually will let people to join in on the call. So when we will do these live streams, we will of course give out a link where people can actually join in on the call and they can ask questions directly, right? We'll see if we can reserve some time or if something really great comes up in a question, we can reach out and we could say, hey, this guy's asking this question. How about we let him aboard and let's ask, you know, have a conversation with him. Maybe he actually wants to hear, okay, why do you guys use this? What was that? Or maybe he can give his side of the story. So I think I can't think of any other channels, uh, at least any other podcast that will actually record and have this. And so that's something unique about us is that we also, I mean, we don't want to be the only ones to ask questions. 
if it gets somebody like Eric Sadal or, or somebody else in the community who is, you know, is very popular and people want to actually talk to them too, we would love to have other people join in and ask questions. This is for the community. We're making this podcast for the community, not just for ourselves. And so we want you guys to join in also. And so with that, uh, I believe that this is a good intro to kind of let you guys know this is what we're all about. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us, tweet at us, uh, send us a Facebook message, YouTube comment, whatever. We'll try to get back to you. And so with that, I thank you for listening. Please subscribe in YouTube, wherever your favorite podcast is, Facebook even. And don't forget to even join our newsletter where we'll be announcing our guests coming up. So with that again, I thank you and good night.